Welcome everyone to TechNAM's end-to-end -end webinar series. Today, we're hosting the second webinar of the series, The World of Wireless. Our presenter is Ben Russell, TechNAM's wireless infrastructure architect. Ben, a self-proclaimed Wi-Fi nerd, has 20 plus years in the network and security field. He has built outdoor metropolitan Wi-Fi networks, engineered wireless for large public venues, and has helped thousands of organizations address and optimize their connectivity. If at any point you have a question, please use the Q&A feature to submit it to the speaker. We'll pause in the middle to take some questions and we'll also have time at the end. With that, Ben, I'll hand it over to you to present the world of wireless. Thanks, Melissa. How's everyone doing today? Um, yeah, the, uh, today we're talking about wireless and how it really relates to today's connectivity. Uh, I'm going to start with a little bit of a history lesson. So I apologize if this is a refresher for anybody who's, uh, who knows a thing or two about wireless, but it's really important to understand where we've come from in the last 20 years of wireless networking um, to understand where we're going with it too. So I'm just going to start with a, a brief timeline here that starts back in the, uh, the turn of century, uh, back in 2000, we had 802.11b was the wireless standard that had come out, and we started to uh, be able to use that in commercial environments. Um, back then, we were generally deploying it to environments like warehouses and hospitals, so we called them the early adopters of, of Wi-Fi. Um, and, you know, I'm going to, all of this is going to be talking about the, the actual data rates that we saw as we, you know, built and tested these networks. Um, so example is 802.11b, any spec sheet is going to tell you that it's going to do 11 megabits per second. But in reality, we only got half of that. 5.5 megabits per second was the realistic throughput of Wi-Fi back then. Um, also, you know, it's important to note that that's throughput per wireless access point. So in a wireless environment, you're sharing the, the medium with everyone else on it. So this was 5.5 megabits per second per each access point and all of the clients that supported it. Not a lot of bandwidth when we look at it today, but back then we were kind of excited about being able to go wireless. So very exciting. <clears throat> on our timeline, we have things like 2001 was when the iPod was released. Uh, just to put a little reference about how, how long ago this was. Um, and then back then in office environments, we saw a transition from a cubicle type environment to these open floor plans uh, yeah, in these offices. Fast forward to 2006, uh, we had 802.11a and 802.11g uh, were in, available in the market. These two technologies, A in the 5 gigahertz and G in the 2.4 gigahertz, each of them gave us about 22 megabits per second of throughput per, per radio. So I'm using the term radio now because we have A is a, a 5 gig radio and G is a 2.4 gig radio. Um, and I'll go into the, the gigahertz frequency stuff in a little bit just so everyone understands it. Again, we got about 22 megabits per second per, per radio. So, you know, each access point could handle about 44 megabits per second. Um, and again, doesn't seem like much today, but back then this was a pretty good big deal. And it made it so that we would start using this in more office environments and businesses, uh, usually not everywhere, but uh, we'd concentrate on um, on conference rooms and and spaces where uh, there was more flex flex use. Then one of the game changers was the smartphone. So in 2007, the iPhone was released, um, and that's when Wi-Fi started to become much more popular. To be honest, because uh, mobile phones could utilize it. Um, and a few years later, 802.11n was released and at the time in 2010 this was a very very drastic change for wireless and what we could do with it um, it was the first time that wireless had taken um, the ability to increase the throughput by using multiple connections simultaneously so again i'm going to explain that a little bit more thoroughly later in this presentation but what we were able to do in the year 211 n was go from that 22 megabits up to in some cases, 150 megabits per second. Um, and that was a, a big, big game changer. Moving right along, along the timeline, um, 802.11n uh, is where we saw wireless prolifically throughout many environments, uh, deployed it across many enterprises, and it became a pretty common standard to have wireless. 
um, and utilize it everywhere. Um, but it was still generally considered a secondary network to uh, the wired network, um, and its its performance was you know was faster than than uh, than it was in the past, but it still wasn't nearly what we could do on the wired network. So. Uh, income to Wi-Fi 5, and then you note the name is a lot easier to remember because thankfully the Wi-Fi Alliance introduced a naming convention for Wi-Fi, so we don't have to refer to them by their IEEE spec names. Um, so 802.11ac became Wi-Fi 5, or also known as the fifth generation of Wi-Fi. Um, so 802.11a, b, g, and n became Wi-Fi's one through four. Um, so that was a lot easier to remember. So now we're, this is Wi-Fi 5. Um, and what they did with the spec for Wi-Fi 5 was uh, increase the, the protocol performance. So even though we're working with the same bandwidth and same capabilities of channels as we had in 802.11n, uh, we were able to increase the throughput and, and performance up to 600 megabits uh, per access point. So we're starting to get closer to the wired throughput. But uh, and again, if you looked at the specs for Wi-Fi 5, they'll say 1.3, 1.5 gig per second. But in reality, this is what we would usually see it as a, as a top throughput capability for uh, Wi-Fi 5 networks. So then we have the Apple Watch and the AirPods came out, all wireless devices that uh, we, we see around all the time today, but just moving along the timeline. Um, Wi-Fi 6 was released in 2022, so we're almost up to current time. The capabilities of Wi-Fi 6, this latest generation, are exceeding the wired ports capabilities. Most wireless access points that have been deployed over the last 15 years or so are connected with a one gigabit, gigabits uh, per second connection. Um, and that Wi-Fi 6 is now capable of exceeding that. And this is, again, this is a real world tested throughput. We can get up to two and a half gigs per second over a Wi-Fi 6 access point. So it's it stands that um, designs for wireless have to have some upstream uh, changes as well because we're starting to outpace that wired connection. But it also means that in aggregate, if you have 10 or 20 devices on there, they may not be feeling the effect of being on wireless as being slower than the wired connection today. Down the bottom there, you'll see uh, we talk about IoT. You've probably heard of Internet of Things, uh, but this is a very, very big growing market where basically every technological thing that has a has power also has a Wi-Fi chip in it. Um, it has some way to communicate to the cloud or to its to its say, control management plane uh, somewhere through a network. So it's a big growing market market um, and we're seeing a very very high density of those devices in wireless networks today and uh, the office there we're seeing a, a drastic change with offices we see a great deal more hoteled offices especially with the hybrid work today as people go return to the office we're seeing more use of hotel offices and not so much the standard uh, assigned office spaces so and last and the current uh, functionality that we have with Wi-Fi or technology we have is Wi-Fi in six gigahertz. So this is not a standard or a generation. It is now a new frequency band of six gigahertz that is available to us for Wi-Fi use. And that, that just opened up last year. And it's, a, it's something we've just started deploying networks now to utilize this, uh, but we're seeing up to 10 gigabits per second and wired equivalent latency. So I haven't mentioned much about latency, but um, latency is something I'll talk about a little bit further. Uh, but this is really key that there's almost no additional latency in this this uh, this network and this frequency band. So it's really key to the future of what we can do with wireless. So let's talk about traffic. So Wi-Fi traffic operates very similar to real car traffic that we deal with every day. So this is an analogy uh, I've used in the past, and it's uh, it's with six gigahertz it's gotten even better so uh wi fi is one two and three we're like having a single lane rural road uh, where you know one, dev one, one device could talk at a time therefore just like a lane one car can drive at a time if you had a slower device running on the road everyone behind it is slowed down uh, the similar imp impact has always been with wireless as well uh, with those single lane roads in wi-fi 4 or 8211 n as i called it before we were introduced multiple lanes so it was multiple input multiple output it was a mimo for short um, and mimo is operates a lot like 
the highway, the interstate that we we know today, uh, where we add more lanes and we can allow more traffic through simultaneously. Um, but as we all know, highways still back up. So as things get busy, um, Wi-Fi 4 and Wi-Fi 5 uh, were, were, uh, were, would back up and slow down. Uh, when we got to Wi-Fi 5, which is one of the most common deployed today, um, what they did is they, they focused on improving the performance of these highways. So even though we're using the same number of multi-channels or multiple, multiple input, multiple output, in many cases, we can get more throughput through by, in this picture, adding interchanges to a highway uh, that would you know, reduce the amount of traffic. So they, they did the same thing, but at the packet level or wireless. And now today we've got Wi-Fi 6, which its main focus was on, again, improving performance through protocols and the packets in the wireless, but also reducing latency. A key element in stable, healthy network connectivity is latency. So the latency on wireless uh, Wi-Fi 6 is much lower than any of the previous generations. And then Wi-Fi in 6 gigahertz, if you can just imagine, this is where I like this analogy, uh, it's like having a flying car that just goes right over the top of all that traffic. Uh, there is no competition in the 6 gigahertz for clients at this moment. And um, even as it grows, you'll see there's a, there's a lot of frequency space, a lot of spectrum to work with. So it's going to be bigger than any road we've been able to use in the past for Wi-Fi. So and I mentioned apps and latency, um, where latency is... Uh, is the speed at which applications communicate and devices communicate to each other. And when we look back at the types of data we've used over Wi-Fi, generally most of it was at the bottom of this pyramid. Uh, asynchronous communication is things like emails and chats and things that really, if they don't get there in a few seconds, it's not the end of the world. Whereas as we moved forward with different things we were putting on the wireless network, for example, large data, the latency became a little bit more important because we needed to get the data to the destination in a, in a reasonable amount of time. About eight years ago, we started to see a heavy use of streaming media. So live streaming video, um, being able to, to watch YouTube, for example, over Wi-Fi was something that when we were dealing with stuff 20 years ago, that was not even thought of. So streaming media became a lot more latency sensitive. And if you've ever been watching a video and it takes a while to load or you get those digital effects, usually that's caused by some form of latency. And then the last but not least in the today's, today's world is real-time voice and video. Even this webinar is generally expected to be in real time, um, but every vo video and voice call that we deal with has extremely low latency uh, intolerancy. As we get up the up the pyramid, things become less tolerant to that latency time um, that we measure with Wi-Fi connectivity. And the last of my kind of history lesson here um, is to just to explain those frequency bands that I've mentioned a couple times. Um, this is just a, a diagram that shows the size of the frequency bands that we use for Wi-Fi. Um, each of them is, this is reflected in the megahertz, the amount of frequency space we have in each of the bands. So the 2.4 gigahertz band that we've been using for 20 years now um, is a, about 80 megahertz of space and then moving up to five gigahertz, which is where most Wi-Fi connectivity operates today, um, is about 400 megahertz of space. And um, I'm also reflecting here is the colors is that by looking at wireless networks, we're seeing a trend that most legacy or low performing wireless devices are being pushed to the 2.4 gigahertz band. Uh, a lot of times that's because of battery life savings or range capabilities of a lower frequency band. Um, those, the, the, those, net, those devices are kind of focused in there. So that's starting to become our IoT network. Uh, to be honest, that's uh, not, not by plan, but just by reality. We're seeing most of our IoT devices today uh, stick to the 2.4 band and then we steer or literally steer clients to the five gigahertz band with technologies so that they can operate voice, video uh, applications faster and more with more stability than if we they're sharing that with those older legacy devices. So in come the six gigahertz, which is 1200 megahertz of space, three times the size of anything we've seen before. Um, and it's 
going to be a complete open field for new devices. Um, so there won't be any support for legacy devices or security for that matter. Six gigahertz will be 100% of the newest wireless security WPA3. And um, it's going to uh, allow us a great deal of growth for the future that we couldn't have imagined uh, even a couple of years ago. That's, uh, I'm gonna pause there. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Ben. Thanks for pausing. I think you've given us a lot of great information and um, I think it's a good time to see if anyone in our audience has any questions for you. So I'll open up the Q&A. If you do have a question, just type it in to that chat or I'm sorry, the Q&A forum and I will convey that over to Ben. So let's just give it 15 seconds or so to give someone a chance to type in. That was great. Thank you. So I'll, I'll make one more note while we wait and see if there's any questions that come in. Um, one of the things I alluded to here was that uh, the 2.4 gigahertz is, is a, a trend we're seeing for those lower power devices because of range. One of the, tech, the, the key differentiators about 2.4, 5, and now 6 um, is the distance that we can use those frequent those channels because of the way the radio frequencies work. Uh, lower frequencies have the ability to go further distance wise and penetrate solid matter easier. So one thing that I just wanted to note here while I was talking about frequencies is that we design 2.4 and 5 gigahertz completely differently for how to uh, get that connectivity and that stable coverage everywhere. And we're recommending that 6 gigahertz uh, is something that people should have designed for uh, because doing a replacement one for one of existing equipment may or may not work for the 6 gigahertz depending on how their building is built. So just want to share that little nugget of information. OK, and we did get a couple of questions. Um, the first one here is, what are the estimated enterprise adoption rates for Wi-Fi 6 and 6 Plus? And when will Wi-Fi 6 become at least 50% of all corporate environments? That's a great question. Um, and I can't say exactly when that's going to be, but I'll talk about the previous generation um, and what we saw. So for Wi-Fi 4, um, that adoption rate took about four years um, back in the 2010 range before we saw, and you've mentioned 50%, that's a great number. Um, that's when we start to see the real benefits of a new um, of, a, of a new technology is when you start to see that the number exceed 50%. Um, so it was about four years then. And then with Wi-Fi 5, that has been cut down to about a year and a half that we saw when that the transition happened to see, uh, you know, we started getting about 50%. Um, and the reason, part of the reason for that I'll share um, is that the manufacturers of endpoints start manufacturing the new technology before the wireless infrastructure even comes out. Um, so right now there are chipsets that are being manufactured for, for Wi-Fi 6E, uh, or they were a year ago. Um, and that even though we couldn't install the infrastructure a year ago. Um, so that's key that they start to get these designs and they get that going into the, the, the next rollout of the phone that releases the tablet, the laptop. Um, we start to see that stuff hitting the market almost as soon as we have the first AP hung for that. Um, so year and a half for Wi-Fi 5, uh, Wi-Fi 6, we have a little bit of a an odd one there because of the timing of it it hit during the pandemic um, and that uh, if anyone knows how purchasing went for uh, devices during the time of the pandemic uh, there was a huge front load of, of new devices being purchased during the beginning of uh, 2020 um, and then there was a huge slowdown and primarily because of the the uh, inability to get the chips in that range. So uh, we haven't truly seen a full Wi-Fi 6 rollover as of yet, but that also means that there, I think that Wi-Fi 6 will be uh, uh, superseded by Wi-Fi 6E in a short order because now the chipsets that are coming into market are mostly 6E capable or six, six gigahertz band Wi-Fi 6 devices. Um, so I think that that's going to basically jump over Wi-Fi 6 a little bit when it comes to the endpoint numbers. OK, and we have two more questions, which I think you've already answered, but I'll read them just in case you wanted to add something. Uh, what is the current estimate for Wi-Fi 5 adoption among all enterprises? And the next question being, when will 6 gigahertz become the normal standard? Which I think you answered, but 
I think I did. I just, you know, so Wi-Fi 5, uh, we definitely see Wi-Fi 5 being um, most of the networks that are out there today are have moved away from 802.11n, which was Wi-Fi 4, onto Wi-Fi 5, um, Wi-Fi 6 um, being the one that uh, hit kind of during the pandemic. It made a, a little bit of a change in the way we saw that, that adoption rate, but um, yeah. And then, I'm sorry, what was the third question? Oh, um, that was it. And what is the current estimate for Wi-Fi 5 adoption among all enterprises? You, you, you've you answered it. OK, great. All right. Thanks um, for those so yeah, there, there's no more questions at this point. OK, well, thank you for those great questions and uh, keep them coming in. Uh, we'll have more time to finish at the end. Thanks, Ben. No problem. Um, so the next and I've finished the history lesson. I wanted to talk about uh, a subject that I've had conversations with people over the years. Um, I had my first conversation about the all wireless workplace about eight years ago when we were talking about what we were planning for the building. I, this particular plan uh, was for 800 per employee office building. And I specifically remember being very almost, you know, I was, I was impressed myself at, at the overall cost savings that the, the customer would have seen. Um, in this scenario uh, because they were reducing the amount of wired infrastructure by not pulling a cable or two cables to each of the desks and saying that they, the entire workplace was going to use wireless as their primary form of connectivity. Not only obviously the cost of the switching infrastructure, the wire, the, the structured cabling infrastructure, um, those costs were much lower if you're just supporting the wireless and you know enhancing the wireless to support that many devices and be that reliable. But it was a funny one was the electrical cost and the cooling of their closets and data center was in the six figures, uh, something I wasn't expecting to hear, but it was a very interesting fact that um, in the day that we can, let's say today, when we can deploy an all wireless workspace, there's actually a lot of cost savings beyond just the infrastructure itself. But when I did talk about that back then, we had a few hurdles uh, that were that were coming our way. So the most common of those uh, was that the wired connection of the desk, in some cases, was still required. We still had desktop computers that were, you know, still out there, you know, pretty commonly at that point. And those, most of those, didn't have wireless. If they did, it was not a good performing wireless. Um, if you've ever used a, a desktop with a wireless adapter in it, uh, it probably wasn't the greatest experience. The phone. The key was the voice over IP phones that people had spent so many years trying to get them into the desk and replace the old analog systems, but those phones didn't have any other way to operate than use power over Ethernet from a switch and a network connection. So that was the big uh, drawback. The pandemic has changed the world the way we live in, and most people are very comfortable using what we used to call a soft phone, which is now Teams, Zoom, and, and WebEx. Um, you know, those are basically teleconference devices that you can use on your mobile phone or your laptop. So that has replaced the need for um, the voice over IP phone for most businesses today. And the last was the fear of the unreliable Wi-Fi. Um, very common that um, you know, it's been expected that Wi-Fi is not as reliable as wired networks, that outages happen, that, and a lot of times that there's no way of identifying what those were. Um, so that's that's a, obviously a big concern if you don't have a wired connection to fall back to at that scenario. Oh, uh, it seems like we're having some trouble. Hang on one sec. No, oh, uh, actually, I'm wrong. That was part of the presentation. <laughs> So what do we do when Wi-Fi trouble strikes? You know, today, this is, uh, again, it's pretty common place that Wi-Fi issues exist, and uh, a lot of times they can be very challenging. So I'm going to talk through a scenario. So imagine you had just either built a new building, renovated your building, or it was time for an infrastructure upgrade. Um, you had a proper wireless design done, um, deployed the wireless as designed, uh, maybe even had the, the system tested and verified after the deployment was complete. All great practices, ones that we do all the time and highly recommend because that is the best way to architect a, a stable wireless network is to start with a good, strong design. Then things start to happen. Problems occur, clients can't connect or can't stay connected, voice and video issues, latency, things that um, in many cases are just invisible to the naked eye. That creates frustration 
anger. Nobody likes to hear that the Wi-Fi is unstable and uh, in a lot of cases have no simple way of saying what's going on. Today, you know, I want to share some of the most common things that we hear about why Wi-Fi isn't working properly. So in many cases, video conferencing everywhere. So I've already touched on this, that, you know, with the age of Zoom, uh, Teams, WebEx, um, and every uh, all the other uh, conference tools out there are everywhere. They are not no longer teleconference from the boardroom or in the conference rooms only. It's a scenario where you can be at your desk, you can be on your phone, you can be, um, you know, you know we've seen a lot of phone booths going into to, uh, to offices now too. Um, and video conferencing is required to work wirelessly in all those places. Interference in neighbors. Um, no new, not a new problem for wireless, but one that has always been there and always will be there. Um, wireless has uh, non-Wi-Fi devices that do interfere with the network, um, even though the infrastructure uh, is capable of ad uh, identifying some of it and adapting around it. Uh, we always do have some issues that still come up through interference. And neighboring networks are, can be just as bad, if not worse. Your neighbor upgrades their Wi-Fi or changes something about their Wi-Fi and it in impacts your environment because you share a wall, you share a floor uh, between the spaces and Wi-Fi doesn't, uh, doesn't, doesn't adhere to those types of things. Um, Wi-Fi is definitely the most used connectivity medium today. Um, whether you have connections to every every desk for people to plug into with docking stations and everything is all nice and, and nice and set up, generally we still see a large percentage of devices connecting from Wi-Fi to the network to the cloud. So it's key that that's that's our number one connectivity. And then the sporadic issues, as I mentioned before, issues don't always happen consistently. Uh, they'll happen in certain places or certain times or just completely uncertainly at all. And that those those types of issues can be extremely hard to troubleshoot without specialty tools or special en engineering skills. The hybrid work workplace. And again, it's going back to the video conferencing um, and the, the hotel desks that we work with today, hybrid work style is very mobile. People want to be able to and need to be able to work from any area of the building, whether that be a hotel desk that does have a connection or a, a conference table or a coffee room uh, in, the, in, the, uh, in the office. Um, but the connectivity needs to work the same everywhere, uh, which was never really the expectation in the years past. Those are some of the, the key things that we see today that are causing Wi-Fi to still be you know, complained about quite a bit. So I just want to give a visual that talks a little bit about how this happens, per se. This is, a, you know, I've, so far I've talked about individual access points and technologies, throughputs, performance, latency. Um, so I'm going to kind of scale that out a little bit. And we're going to talk about, you know, five access points in one. Not a very large office, um, you know, might, might be a 30 person employee office that has uh, this many access points, for example. Once you add in the client devices, and this is just highlighting the laptops and the phones, this is what a Wi-Fi network might look like if you could physically see it. Um, and each of the dotted lines represents their connection. So as you can see, the green ones are good connections. I mean, some clients will be connected and have a good, solid, strong connection. Others might have a mediocre connection, which means that they're not disconnecting from the wireless, but their performance might be impacted and they might not know it until they start their video call. Um, and that's you know one of the top complaints we get is that video calls are not working or there's delays or, or impact. And then the red one um, is a bad connection, which in many cases might be noticeable. You might even get a notification that your, your connectivity is poor, um, or you might see the signal bar is low on the device. Um, but you know, most of the time it's tough to determine uh, what, what those causes of those issues are as they may vary. So we at Technium have been working very hard to, uh, to solve these problems. So our first way to address that, as I mentioned before, is advanced design. Um, wireless design has been something that we've been doing for 20 years, and uh, it's now we're, we're taking that to the next level with the ability to uh, design in the six gigahertz range. We're designing wireless networks for six gigahertz today to be able to support that uh, you know, now and into the future. 
as that's the, the, the greatest growth area for wireless capabilities. Um, we are also designing for multi-gig. So as, we, as we've grown past the, the gig world, uh, we're into the multi-gig world. So uh, network connectivity, as we've seen the, the Wi-Fi technologies, we can exceed um, one gig connections very quickly now, potentially get into the point where we're pushing 10 gigabits per second over each individual access point. And that's something we, we uh, the networks weren't really designed for. So we're designing the network from the ground up, from the all the way from the, the endpoint to the cloud. And last but not least is changing the way we do support from proactive or from reactive to proactive. Uh, right now, all you know, generally all support from wireless is done as a reaction to a problem, um, and then we we are now uh, releasing a new ability to address those issues proactively to monitor for 24 by 7 performance and be able to identify when something is is brewing, not when it happens. So, introducing Wi-Fi assurance. Uh, technology that we at Technium have just released this year, uh, and it's just to do that, to perform testing for teleconferencing, performance, throughput, and latency on your wireless network, and be able to provide both trending data, analytics, and reporting on that, as well as immediate response and uh, to, to events to notify when something is happening in the wireless. So as I mentioned before, a neighboring network moves in, changes something about your wireless environment, uh, this, this service is designed to identify those changes and notify the individuals who need to know that something is, is changing. Uh, going back to my diagram of, of a small network here, we talk about why these, we answer why these are red, why are they orange? So here I talk about a poor roaming event with these, uh, this client. Here we talk about the, the load balancing isn't working properly on the infrastructure. So and we can make recommendations on how to change that. Here we talk about one that no matter what any infrastructure does out there, they're usually blind to what the, the operating system is doing. So this is an OS update that's causing a, a connection issue for those clients, um, specifically those clients, a very common one that uh, we hear about. And then, as again, as that my reference to the neighboring network or congestion, uh, we can detect that type of stuff and notify. Goal is to take all those connections and make them all good connections, stable, reliable wire Wi-Fi connections that will surpass the capabilities of wired networks um, today and into the future. That's all I had to share with you. So feel free to connect to me on LinkedIn. I am the Wi-Fi nerd. I'd uh, always be interested in hearing your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. That was great. I uh, will open it up to questions from everybody now. If, if you'd like to throw that in the, the Q&A chat, um, we did get one while you're presenting. And okay. um, this person asks, in your estimate, what specifications are required for any future Wi-Fi standards to be met for engineers and business execs to see Wi-Fi as a definite substitute for all wired internet connectivity, even the fastest ones? That is a great question. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, so uh, certifications and, and knowledge there, um, I, that's the, the reason I say it's a really great question because a lot of the certifications that exist out there today are focused on the technical um, side of wireless. And, it, and in my experience over the 20 years working in this, a lot of them are very solution specific. Um, there are a couple of uh, a couple out there that um, we can do a follow up from after this webinar. I can send some information that are vendor agnostic, um, and I generally prefer to go that way versus vendor specific. Um, but I'll check to see if there are some that are for um, you know both administrators and um, and executives to be able to understand wireless and how we can uh, we can change the the point of view. That's I think it's kind of what you're asking about wireless and how it's uh, relied on. Uh, I can see if we can find some of that and provide it to everyone who's joined the webinar. Great. Thank you. Um, we have no further questions at this time. If a question does pop up, please um, you can email us at solutions at techniumnetworking.com or just reach out to the Wi-Fi nerd himself on LinkedIn. So this concludes our webinar and the series, the second webinar in our series. 
please, to help us improve, if you don't mind, just take a minute to um, fill out our quick survey. It's about four questions. Um, it'll just help us to be better. Um, a recording of this and all webinars will be sent to you when we wrap up the series. In the meantime, we look forward to seeing you again at our third webinar, Email Hacking and Financial Fraud. So I'll post that survey link here. Um, I look forward to hearing what you thought and um, we'll see you again next time.